This talk and the JavaScript for WordPress conference are brought to you by our sponsors at 10up and WP Buffs. 10up makes a better web with finely crafted websites and tools for content creators. Check out their junior and senior dev positions at 10up.com slash careers. WP Buffs provides 24-7 fully managed support and white label agency services. Find out how they can help you focus on what you do best at wpbuffs.com slash partnerships. Yeah, so we're going to talk about security in JavaScript, and let's get to it. Um, I'm making some assumptions in this talk. Um, one of those assumptions is that you're not running JavaScript on the server. Um, I think it's pretty rare that people are doing that around WordPress, although it does happen. Um, we're going to kind of ignore that um, for the sake of this talk. Um, we're also going to assume that you're most interested in JavaScript security. You don't want to hear the basics of WordPress security or PHP security. We will touch on some of those things because I think people who are doing mostly JavaScript for WordPress still need some PHP security advice. Um, there are just too many situations where that is what you need to know about and what you need to consider. Um, so we'll go into those in somewhat more detail. Um, but obviously, I think this being the JS for WP conference, uh, we need to focus more on JavaScript than on PHP. Um, the last bullet point here is that you're hoping not to get hacked. And I say that for two reasons. One is to state the kind of obvious problem that most people um, come to security for, which is that they're worried about bad things happening to their site, and they want to avoid that. The other reason is that you can make a pretty interesting talk about doing hacks with JavaScript and all the cool um, bad things you can make happen on the internet uh, using it. In general, other than mentioning those things, we aren't going to go into great detail about them. I'm not going to show you how to take over people's Facebook accounts or anything like that. Um, so I just want to make that clear because that is a definite kind of security talk you'll see. Um, you can look up a conference called DEF CON if you're really interested in that stuff. Um, but this is not uh, going to be focused on that really at all. It's about development um, and keeping that secure. Um, there's a lot of common uh, server-side specific advice you've probably heard before if you've ever watched a security talk. Um, I've certainly given that talk. Um, both formally and informally many times. I think it's a very good topic. It's a very good talk. Um, but we're going to try to stay clear of most of the very obvious, very um, boring stuff and focus on some of the more interesting, uh, more cutting edge, more JavaScript specific uh, features as they make sense. But some of that advice you'll hear is to sanitize all your inputs and escape all your outputs and write safe SQL and use nonces and blah, blah, blah. We've heard it all a thousand times. And so this talk is mostly going to focus on newer, more interesting things than that, things that I had to go learn about a little bit more when putting together this talk that I had like vaguely known about. So um, hopefully you'll learn something new um, in this talk. So as I said, that's my biggest goal is that you'll learn something new. Um, I hope you'll also have some more confidence securing your JavaScript code after watching this talk. You'll understand some PHP server-side advice. As I mentioned, uh, because of the way WordPress works, because very few of us are using JavaScript on the server, and even if we are, if we're doing WordPress at all, there's still PHP running on the server. You do have to understand that stuff. Um, and the last goal I have is pretty selfish, which is that I have a course all about WordPress security, and I just want to make sure that people who watch this talk know that it exists. It's called WordPress Security with Confidence. Um, and we'll talk about it a little bit more at the end. So why isn't this a JavaScript only talk? Initially, I talked to Zach about giving a talk here. Uh, and uh, I heard him say 15, one five minutes. I don't know if I misheard or that plans changed, probably a little of both. Um, but I was like, great, I can totally give a JavaScript security talk in 15 minutes. There's not that much to JavaScript security. Um, partly, I was just wrong about that. but. I also mis misunderstood that this is now a 50, five zero minute talk. Uh, so that obviously requires a slightly different and wider focus. So Zach and I talked and touching on a lot of server side things is totally acceptable. I got the green light on that and I was like, oh, what a relief. Um, so why is JavaScript kind of a simple um, security model? Part of it is that JavaScript itself is sandboxed. And we'll go into a little more detail about that. What about what that means, but basically it means that JavaScript can't do that much dangerous stuff on its own within the confines of a web browser window. 
In short, if the data, if something isn't persisted anywhere on a web server, the dangers of a JavaScript hack are pretty small because of that sandboxing thing. Um, you can do bad things with JavaScript in a web browser for sure, um, but the extent of the damage is pretty small if that attack uh, in JavaScript uh, is not stored. And in WordPress, to, in order to store a JavaScript attack, you're practically speaking going to go through the PHP web server end of the whole system. So the JavaScript sandbox is something that we rarely actually think about, but it's really important to keeping our browsers and computers safe. Um, you don't even worry in general that, oh, this JavaScript on this website is going to steal my operating system password or download or upload files from my computer. Um, but if the JavaScript sandbox were not written uh, cleanly, were not maintained cleanly, that would be an issue. You would just suddenly find out that your, uh, you know, that file that you'd been saving on your desktop of, I don't know, your great American novel uh, had gotten stolen from someone. So that could happen if JavaScript didn't work in the way it does inside of browsers. Um, but that, that security model also protects it from other processes. So the JavaScript process is sandboxed in such a way that it can't reach out to find out, hey, what's your Dropbox doing right now? And what's, what's uh, you know, Windows Explorer doing right now? None of those things are available to a JavaScript process. It also means that tabs are isolated. So uh, what, you know, one JavaScript tab in one browser window is not able to access a different browser tab in a different browser window. And that's really important for the overall security of the thing. The last thing that it means is that it's hard for JavaScript to arbitrarily reach out to re web resources, um, which is a big boon for security, but does have some implications. So that sandbox though, it doesn't mean that JavaScript's secure. It doesn't mean we don't need to think about security at all. Um, obviously bad things still happen. JavaScript hacks still happen. So you have to be careful in that sandbox because there are still some pretty bad things that can happen within the confines of a single browser window. Uh, an example, one of my favorite examples is that if you ever open up the browser, browser, browser console, on a Facebook page, uh, you'll see this warning that I've got up on my screen. Stop! This is a browser feature intended for developers. If someone told you to copy and paste something here to enable a Facebook feature or hack someone's account, it is a scam and will give them access to your Facebook account. Uh, it's pretty accurate. Uh, I'm sure that that's happened before. I'm sure there's a reason that Facebook put this warning here, um, but it's a pretty uncommon type of attack. We'll talk about it more in a sec. Um, but this is the kind of thing that can happen within the confines of a single browser window is that it's possible to take over a Facebook account uh, if the right things happen. So the sandbox policy is, as I mentioned, stopping uh, JavaScript from generally reaching out and doing very weird things across the whole internet. So it's, it's somewhat more complicated to just like drop on an arbitrary hacker URL all your passwords. And that's enforced by something called the same origin policy. Basically what the same origin policy means is that uh, JavaScript can only come from, can access back to the same domain. So it stops things like stealing passwords. It stops things like unexpected stuff suddenly appearing in a page because that JavaScript process is unable to reach beyond its domain. That is to say the domain that hosted it. But it does mean that you can get stuff from the same server as hosted your script. Um, so the downside, the real heart downside of the same origin policy is that you can only get stuff from the same server as your hosted script. And as we move into JavaScript development more generally, uh, this becomes an issue of like, I wanted to use this API that you know my friend had set up, or I wanna use this API from Google. Um, so the same origin policy kind of complicates that. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about how you get around it. Uh, the question is, can you use external APIs? And the answer, the punchline is absolutely yes. There are basically three ways you can do that. The first of which is that you just proxy the request. So if I run example.com and I've served a JavaScript file from example.com, that JavaScript file is unable to reach out uh, and contact an API on an external server in general, given default uh, web setups. Um, and this is again for us, this is a security thing that browsers are doing. Um, so one, the first solution that you can have to this limitation is that 
you can set up a proxy on example.com. And what that means is that if I'm at example.com, I serve that JavaScript, the JavaScript calls back to me at example.com and says, hey, I want to access the API uh, that Google provided. Then because example.com's Java or PHP or Ruby or what have you is not subject to that same origin policy, it's not JavaScript running in a browser, it's JavaScript or Java or PHP can reach out to that API provided by whoever and circle back and do it. So that's the, the oldest way to solve the same origin policy as like a security headache. Obviously you're reaching out to APIs you trust. Um, that is the way that that security is. Um, you're not just being a bad person by uh, uh, re accessing that API. The next solution that people came up with to work around the single origin policy, because it's pretty inefficient to have to proxy every request back to your own domain, um, is what's called JSONP. And, and this is, um, a really elegant hack for the problem. So I've kind of rounded the J, uh, the single origin, the same origin policy to a script has to only uh, load on the same page, but you might have realized, well, but I can load say JavaScript files from CDNs that aren't my same domain. Why does that work? Um, that's basically because browsers are happy to load JavaScript. They just don't want that JavaScript reading or writing from external domains different than the one that it loaded from. So. The way JSONP works is that a browser is happy to accept a script tag that links out to an external file. So what you would do is basically trick the browser into thinking that you were loading a new script tag, but that script tag would actually be executable code. Um, so JSONP stands for JSON with padding, and the padding is actually a function call. You tell the external API what your function should be called, and it wraps its JSON, which is what you were actually going for in the first place inside of a function call, like in this case, foo on my screen. So JSONP is kind of deprecated, but it's still pretty common out there. It's something you'll hear about, something you'll see around as an acronym. Um, and that's the basic concept is you're routing around the same origin policy by adding this padding to a JavaScript file so that when you load the JavaScript, it executes for you. Um, but that is deprecated in favor of something called CORS. And CORS stands for cross-origin resource sharing. And what this is, is that an API itself can say, hey, it's okay for example.com to access me. Uh, it can also say it's okay for anything to access me, which is actually the way that modern APIs provided by say Google or some other company that is doing API first, they want you to really make sure that you use their APIs and uh, trust them and all that stuff. They're gonna provide for course uh, support um, by essentially allowing star slash star, uh, which is the wildcard any, any domain is allowed to access. This is what it says. There are a bunch of other HTTP headers involved with course, um, but this access control allow origin is really what allows your browser to access that. What happens is your browser will reach out to the server before it actually sends the data and says, are you accepting this kind of request? And it says, yes, I am. And you're allowed to share it with me. Um, and then, and only then will that be sent. And that's kind of the security implicit in course. All right, so that's kind of all I've got about that sandbox and the same origin policy. Um, obviously it's keeping us secure on the web so much that we don't even think about it and we kind of take it for granted. But there are so many bad things that would happen if we kind of didn't keep JavaScript in that little sandbox or if the same origin policy hadn't been enforced for dozens of years. Um, so moving on, the next thing I wanna talk about at some length is uh, XSS, uh, which probably if you've heard a security talk you're familiar with, but if not, in short, it's bad. Um, so cross-site scripting, which is not abbreviated CSS for the possibly obvious reason that there's already a common web acronym called CSS. Um, so Wikipedia says that XSS enables attackers to inject client-side scripts into web pages viewed by other users. Cross-site scripting vulnerability may be used by attackers to bypass access controls such as the same origin policy. We just talked about the same origin policy. Hopefully that rings a bell. So the idea of XSS is generally just doing bad things with JavaScript. So it's bypassing the same origin policy. It's taking control on the same origin, any of that kind of thing. 
So examples of cross-site scripting attacks that might happen that you might have heard about. You can steal browser history. You can make it look like a user clicked on things, a like on Facebook or something like that. And generally, because as we're mostly JavaScript developers here, I'm assuming, um, you know that you can do basically any change to any web page if you've got enough JavaScript loaded. So you can just confuse a user by making one button look like another, by um, anything and everything that's possible can happen if you're able to load your own JavaScript onto a, a average user's page. And so generally, you're in your cross-site script and you're trying to avoid the execution of random JavaScript. So there are kind of three broad types of cross-site scripting. You'll hear different counts and slightly different numbers, but this is the most sensible way I thought to divide it up. So you've got what's called a reflected or non-persistent attack. And non-persistent is the really important part here. What we're meaning in this case is that this is JavaScript that loads into a single user's page, but not every user's page. And so, so the most common way this is accomplished is that you have a query string at the end, something like say an age value. And uh, instead of putting in an actual age value in that like age equals in the URL, you put instead age equals script tag, my cross-site scripting attack, close script tag, and a very naive uh, browser page, um, either via PHP or JavaScript or something like that else might happily put that into the page. And then the browser sees that script tag and goes, oh, I should run this. And whatever that uh, cross-site script has been built to do, it can do very easily. So this is only uh, important if you have left your page insecure and someone clicks onto that URL that had the attack stored in the URL or something like that. So this isn't super dangerous. It's bad because via email or uh, text message or something like this, this attack could propagate. But it's much less bad than the next class, which is where you're able to store the cross-site scripting attack on the attacked site. Um, so way back five or 10 years ago now, when MySpace was still a thing people talked about, there was this bug uh, where they basically had a persistent cross-site scripting vulnerability that if you loaded certain people's pages, they would you would automatically friend some other people. Um, even more recently, I think probably in the last year or two, I think Twitter had this self-replicating tweet thing, it, it, like either auto-retweeted itself, I think probably is what it did, or it per perhaps uh, tweeted the new tweet again. Um, and again, this by simply visiting the twitter.com website, you would see this attack, it would load, it would uh, do the retweeting for you. And these were really dangerous because they were stored on the attacked site's uh, web infrastructure and so propagated much more widely than a reflected or non-persistent attack could have. So um, persistent attacks are really the class I think are most dangerous and most things you need to be on the lookout for. The last class is, if you remember that Facebook uh, image I showed about the browser console, that's what's called a self XSS attack, which is where somebody through, you know, social social uh, trickery is able to convince someone that, yeah, just paste this code into this place and it'll be great. Um, and you have immense power inside of a browser, browser console to run whatever arbitrary JavaScript you want. Uh, and that's why a self XSS attack is dangerous. And the reason that Facebook has made that prominent warning on the console for average users who don't understand what they're doing when they go in there. So in general, against cross-site scripting attacks, uh, you'll hear about three main means of defense, validate, sanitize, and escape. Um, and then the last one that I wanna talk about, which I think is new to a lot of people, is called CSP. Uh, and we'll get to that in a sec. First, what's validation? So validation is basically where, again, let's take the example of an age value. So I expect someone to give me their age um, and I'm going to expect that an age is going to be a numeral between the numbers zero and 200, um, obviously in years. Um, and if I do that, when I validate, I simply say, hey, this doesn't look like a number between zero and 200, uh, please enter a valid value. Um, and so this is a user facing check where the person who's put in a script tag sees like, oh, I did this wrong. Or a browser that's injected it will um, also you know, be protected because the user will 
be prompted to change that value. So validation is good because it gives users a sense of where, where they've gone wrong. But the real protection comes when you sanitize. So sanitize uses the same idea of checking for uh, invariance, things you believe will always be true about a value you expect. Um, but the difference is that when you sanitize, you aren't necessarily giving user feedback. You're simply taking up the bad stuff. So if someone tries to submit their age as script tag, blah, 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 close script tag, you'll just pull that all out. Maybe if there was a number in the middle of it, you'll act like that was the age they put in there. That's how sanitization is different than validation. Validation, you're like, hey, user, this is wrong. Sanitization, you're just like, nope, I'm not gonna take any of that, but this part looks okay. Um, so that's the big difference there. And so these are on journeys into a server. So again, this is, really protection against persistent attacks, but you can also do this to protect against a, a reflected or non-persistent attack. At the other end, and the most effective thing against a non-persistent attack is just to make sure you uh, do what's called escaping. And escaping is basically, again, almost all cross-site scripting attacks are gonna start with an opening script tag. Um, so what happens is the browser interprets that as actual executable code. And so if you instead replace the carrot, uh, the V sideways Vs, the rest less than greater than signs with the character encoded HTML entities of the ampersand GT colon, or the ampersand LT colon, um, probably if you've done a lot of WordPress writing about code, you've had to do this yourself. Um, but if you escape text before you show it, then that age that actually contained a script tag will be safe by virtue of the fact that the browser won't think that that script tag is something it's supposed to run. So that's another means of defense. And ideally, we have this concept in security called defense in depth. And what defense in depth means is that if you have three means of protection against this kind of thing, use all three of them. Don't just use the, don't just rely on escaping because then if you screw up escaping, you're done, whereas if you've done all three of these, you're much less likely to have a problem. So classic WordPress security advice is to make sure you do all of these things and it's a good idea. All right, so I think CSP is something people haven't heard of a thousand times. Um, in this slide was me playing with the cool features of the uh, slide deck software that I was using. Um, but basically CSP stands for Content Security Policy. And content security policy is a relatively new uh, idea about how you can protect against cross-site scripting. So I don't feel like it's used that much in WordPress, so that's why I wanna talk about it. Content security policy, like cores that we mentioned earlier, relies on HTTP headers. So um, as you probably are familiar, WordPress spits out HTML, but around that HTML, as it goes across the internet, there are what are called headers on top, which are basically things that say like, how should this be cached? And uh, what's the size of this? And those sorts of things, what URL was this at? All of that is called an HTTP header. And we don't do a lot of it with uh, within WordPress. Often the server itself generates those and we don't think about them. So Apache or Nginx generates them. And there is a PHP command called header that you can just use to add your own. You can also do CSP via equivalent meta header tags. So basically in the head, there's something called a meta tag that you've probably used for say a meta description that you can use to um, essentially simulate an HTTP header without needing to reach out and actually create your own HTTP header um, in that you're able to browser support doing that with the content security policy itself. Basically with a content security policy, you're telling the browser where JavaScript can be executed from. So as an example, you'll say only from my own domain or only from my domain and from Google or only from my domain in a CDN I trust or only from this list of 10 things. And generally you use a content security policy to disable inline JavaScript. And this is basically where we get into how a content security protects you. Almost always the cross-site scripting vulnerabilities we've been talking about are where there is an unintended by the author of the software inline JavaScript. So those two things are super important, unintentional and inline. So the reason that we typically use a content security policy to disallow inline JavaScript is that then all the intentional JavaScript will be offloaded out of this same file and the inline JavaScript is basically known 
uh, can be treated as hostile by the browser and just ignored. So with the content security policy in place, inline JavaScript is uh, effectively invalidated in the same way that escaping would do it, but without you needing to actually escape in your code. Again, defense in depth and all that. Ideally, you stack this rather than uh, use it exclusively, but this is a great way to protect against it. You also, one benefit to it is that you have to write cleaner and better code because you typically will have to move all your JavaScript to external files to get the protection of the content security policy itself. So the issue with doing content security policy in WordPress, and the reason that I think it's, it's not just that people aren't aware of it, that it isn't common advice, it's also that it's not um, the most bulletproof advice because WordPress plugins are the core to the WordPress ecosystem. And kind of the reason that we're using WordPress is that we can just toggle off and on a plugin to make a new contact form to, you know, whatever it is. And so these plugins are super good, but they also make it hard to kind of maintain order. You don't know for sure um, until you try that, you know, that contact form plugin you're, you're running isn't loading a JavaScript from a server you didn't expect. Um, the other big downside of content security policy is that in general, WP localized script is going to uh, be in line. So for those who aren't familiar, WP localized script is just a PHP function that we use similar to WP and Q script, but we use it to pass variables between our JavaScript uh, and our PHP. Basically we make the PHP call and then WordPress creates this JavaScript global variable uh, that contains it, typically does it via uh, inline JavaScript, I actually think always, I'm not sure what I'm saying, typically. Um, but it is possible to turn on a content security policy. Uh, it's just a little uh, complicated. And there is a plugin that helps with this. I haven't used it in great depth, um, but it basically, uh, there's a uh, feature in content security policy where you can report um, to a URL, um, basically violations of your policy, which is helpful from a debugging perspective of like, why didn't this load? Oh, it's because, this script I wasn't expecting came from this plugin. And so this, this plugin is basically there to help you uh, with that part of this as well, because it can take those reports from content security policies on browsers and uh, show them to you in your WordPress admin. So definitely check it out if this is an interesting idea for you. Um, so I've mentioned HTTP headers a couple times and there exists a bunch of other HTTP security headers in the world. And the easiest place I can think of that I've found to look into these is what's called the OWASP Header Security Project. I've got the URL on my screen there, but basically OWASP stands for the Open Web Application Security Project, um, I believe. So this is a like kind of recursive acronym where SP stands for Security Project. But OWASP is this entity that basically is a deliberative body of people who are interested in security, who wanna talk about it, who want to help other people be better at security, all of those sorts of things. Um, and the header security project is a specific effort by a specific subset of those people to compile and uh, you know broaden support for HTTP security headers that can increase the security of the browser. So if you check that out, you'll see a site that looks a lot like this. This uses the underlying uh, media wiki software that you've seen on uh, Wikipedia, et cetera. Um, part of the reason I screenshotted this is because um, they, they're they using this like jQuery UI tab view that I haven't seen in a while. And I was a little confused by how empty the page looked when I first clicked there. But if you click over to the header tab, you'll see a list of all the different uh, security headers that exist. So H HSTS, um, basically now that HTTPS is a more common thing, HSTS is more, more important because what it does is it tells browsers only ever transmit data to my site via HTTPS, never ever do HTTP, uh, which is something that browsers are typically too flexible about. So you can see a bunch of other hazards and uh, you'll notice that the, I think sixth one down is the content security policy that I mentioned. So all of these are really good. I encourage you to look into them if you're curious about this. Um, the one thing I would say is that these headers have a limitation. Other than the content security policy itself, browser support on these headers is pretty uneven, um, which means basically some of them are supported by Microsoft browsers, which is to say IE and Edge and Safari, or uh, only Chromium supports this, or 
uh, any variation on that kind of mixing of different things. Um, comes to security policy in my looking was the only one of these headers that is uniformly supported across all the browsers. Um, and part of that is actually because a lot of those headers on that list are slightly less effective than the content security policy itself. Um, like one of them is just to turn off the ability to load frames, which is a great idea, um, but is not nearly as impactful as the ability to use a cross-site uh, content security policy to break all cross-site scripting attempts in the world. So that's just a thing to be aware of. It's really all I have that's JavaScript specific. I wanna talk a little bit about the REST API in WordPress, because I think almost everyone who's doing JavaScript with WordPress is using the REST API. So there are two basic security concerns I want to, I mean, three, two, three uh, security uh, concerns that I've got. One is authentication, and the other is custom route security. The gremlins are on this slide purely because I didn't want there to only be two, be two bullet points, but I wanted to have a bullet point slide. Um, so authentication is, uh, basically the solution to the problem that HTTP is a stateless protocol. We've mentioned the headers, we've mentioned how you have a body which includes the HTML, but there's nothing built into HTTP that says, hey, I know who this person is. And so when you do web application building, you have to figure out authentication. Um, so we don't want strangers getting access to our data, um, but we do need a way to know who someone is. So authentication is broadly the class of solutions to that problem. With the REST API, you have basically uh, five authentication options, at least that I'm aware of. Uh, Cookie-based, basic auth, OAuth, 1A, application passwords, and JSON web tokens. And we'll just go into all of those, them in a little more depth and talk a little bit more about what they mean. So Cookie Auth is basically using the same authorization system, auth, sorry, authentication system as WordPress itself. Um, so WordPress, um, you're almost certainly familiar, you log into WordPress and what happens is it sets a cookie on you and whether how long that cookie lasts is based on whether or not you check that remember me check mark on the login screen. So if you use cookie auth, auth with the REST API, you're basically piggybacking on the WordPress authentication system in full. Um, so you can use this easily in the admin area, but the one thing to note is that you need to add nonces to your headers, again, HTTP headers come into play, uh, to avoid uh, CSRF. Real quick, diversion, what's CSRF? CSRF stands for cross-site request forgery. Um, the OWASP people I mentioned in that header project have this thing called the OWASP top 10. And it's a list of the most common vulnerabilities in web applications. And they just updated it last year. CSRF in the 2013 revision, which was uh, current until the end of 2017 when they released a new one, was like number seven on that list. Um, so it, because it's a good acronym and because it was number seven on the list, it got talked about a lot. Um, and basically what happens is in this attack, you take a form, but you secretly change the action, possibly via cross-site scripting uh, issue, and you change the form's impact when it's submitted. So rather than being a form that like asks for how many cookies you want grandma to bake you this weekend, it instead, uh, changes that into the millions of dollars that you will transfer between bank accounts. Um, that's a little silly as an example. Honestly, when I look up CSRF vulnerabilities, a lot of them feel silly in that way, but you basically post to a form endpoint that's a little different than the one that uh, the person thought they were, but the impact is similar. So what happens is it looked like they thought they were doing one thing, you actually made them do another. And so what we do to solve this is we encode the intent privately in forms. Um, so typically in WordPress, that's gonna be what we call a nonce, which stands for a number used once. And we encode the fact that this is about cookies that grandma should make into a nonce. And then when we accept the form, we check that nonce and say, is this about cookies grandma should make? Um, and then if it is, we just accept it as if it was valid. So this has fallen off the OWASP top 10, um, basically because nonces have become pretty ubiquitous. And they're the reason that you need to use nonces if you um, are going to be using cookie-based auth in the WordPress ecosystem. All right, so back to the REST API. The next authentication option you have is what's called basic authentication. Um, this is a plugin that you would install 
Uh, basic authentication is, I would say, a very easy and very old technology, which is good and bad. Um, if you've ever log tried to log into a page and seen that like browser rendered login form that says like username and password, that is almost certainly under the hood going to be basic authentication. Um, and the issue with basic authentication is it's not super secure. It totally is good enough for like you have a WordPress development site and you want to uh, constrain it, turn on the Apache basic auth and you're golden. Um, but basic auth under the hood is actually just doing a two-way encoding. It's called base64 encoding of a username and password. So it's almost as bad, almost the same, close enough for all intents and purposes as just passing your username and password in plain text in the request. So you can secure basic auth by basically requiring that it goes over HTTPS. But other than that, basic auth is pretty insecure. So this is not a way most people, myself included, would recommend that you go into production with the REST API application, but it, it does work and is effective. And if you absolutely had to, you could use it but it's not a good security practice because especially if that WordPress site is over HTTP and you can't trust that that channel has been secured via the certificates that are involved in HTTPS, uh, you're going to have a possible compromise pretty quickly with that using basic auth. The next option is what's called OAuth 1A. OAuth is a general standard um, that was developed by Twitter this is a plugin that you install to work with the REST API. You may notice that as a recurring theme here. Um, the only authentication baked into the REST API is the cookie auth we touched on first. Um, but OAuth is a flow engineered by Twitter, and it's very similar to the experience of using Facebook to log into apps. So you basically are going to see a log, an intermediate login screen. In this case, it'll be WordPress, and then then the application gets a cookie, uh, sorry, gets a token that it can use to say like, oh, I am that user because I have the token that you gave this user. Um, OAuth 1A is a spec that was developed in a, we can't assume HTTPS um, world. And so that's why it's been implemented for the REST API. This plugin hasn't been updated in a little while. Uh, I think it still works, but this isn't OAuth 2. Um, which is something you will find actually slightly more commonly documented online because OAuth 2 uh, was simplified a little bit because it required HTTPS. And I think wisely, uh, no one has built uh, OAuth 2 um, version for WordPress because you don't want to assume that every WordPress site uh, is going to be using HTTPS. It should be the case, but it isn't today. The next option is application passwords. Again, this is a plugin you install. And basically, this becomes a token, you know, a long string, a password that your application has. So you manage it, and it's a typically long-term password. So you will go create the password inside of your admin area, and you can just have your, your password uh, be stored. Um, you, you know, you, you get into the, all the problems of putting passwords in various places when you do this kind of thing. But especially if it's a server-based system, you know, you're writing a node app rather than a uh, JavaScript in the client side app, this version works fine. And you just would go revoke the token at any time that you felt like um, the security of that token had been compromised for whatever reason. Um, JSON Web Tokens is a another option. And JWT is often the abbreviation you'll hear. And JWT is actually a common industry standard. It's got like the W3C, I think, spec uh, written all about it. And this is, again, a plugin you install in WordPress. And JWT can be used for lots of things. It can actually be used for encoding um, any data that you transmit over the internet. Um, it's basically an encoding system, a uh, you know public-private key pair encoding system, very similar to what you may have experienced with SSH or something like that. JWT auth works actually very similar to basic auth. It's just that the encrypted, uh, the sort of username and password encryption, quote unquote, that basic auth does via base64 happens via a much more complicated and much more secure cryptographically signed based um, system that's much harder for a, uh, a, a snooper to get access to. So JWT is a better version of basic auth in general. So that's really all I have to say about authentication. Um, all of those options, with the possible exception of basic auth, are very usable. Cookie auth is definitely the simplest one by far. 
Um, but you absolutely will have the the experience of, oh, I can't do that in certain classes of trying to use the WordPress REST API. And that's when, say, uh, probably application passwords are the next most easy and comfortable for most people to use. Just throw that on your Node app and it can access all of your WordPress data. And the last um, bit of REST API security, I think, is REST routes. So, WordPress has already provided us the post endpoint and the taxonomies endpoint and the users endpoint and all that stuff, common stuff that we're gonna do. But if you have a plugin that say stores custom data and you want to expose that data, or if you wanna take the default WordPress data and combine it in an interesting way and then make that available via an API, you're going to be either exposing or accepting data on your own route. Um, I believe this is register rest route, though it honestly uh, has slipped my mind a little bit if there's a WP on there or not. But basically you're gonna register this rest route and then you're in charge of the entire process of that rest route. You're in charge of deciding what data gets prepared for it. And in turn, you're also in charge of making sure that that endpoint is completely secure. There are some helpers in register rest route, um, but in either of these cases, you need to keep in mind that you are responsible for the security of the endpoints you build on the REST API. Um, WordPress cannot and does not do that for you. So there are some common things you wanna make sure you do. If you're exposing data, the biggest thing is to check for, I realized that I typoed this slide, I meant to say authentication and then authorization. Um, and again, I mentioned this earlier, but authentication is to say, is this user who I think they are? And authorization is, is this person allowed to access what they're about to access? Um, and it's really important that you do both of those things, especially in the ecosystem of WordPress where we have actual user roles. So you might authenticate someone, but their actual user role is not high enough for the data you're trying to expose or not expose as the case may be. So you wanna make sure that you check both of those things. Is this person uh, authorized and do they have the, uh, are they authenticated, sorry, and are they authorized to do this? Um, the last thing, which is kind of um, touching back on a common point, uh, is SQL injection becomes an issue when you're exposing your own data tables to the world. Um, and it's one of those things you hear about a lot. It's one of those things we're kind of protected from in WordPress because WordPress has so many functions that wrap database access, but it's really important as you get into exposing your own data on your own endpoints that you think about this thing that is often easy to forget in WordPress. So similarly for accepting data, again, I, I meant to make this say authentication and authorization, but because I edited the slides this morning, I screwed that up and I'll have to change it after. Um, but basically the other thing about accepting data is that you wanna remember this idea of validation sanitization we touched on earlier. Don't just take the data and put it in your database because that then becomes a vector for this persistent cross-site scripting attack I mentioned. Um, anywhere that you're accepting data, you should make sure that you at least sanitize it. Ideally, you validate and then sanitize it uh, so that the user gets some feedback that their data will be changed. Um, and this is super important for protecting you because if you just put it in blindly, you don't know where else in the whole WordPress ecosystem of different plugins, different page templates, whatever, that data is gonna be exposed. So again, that defense in depth idea is why we want to make sure that we do that. Um, again, don't just put this data into the database with custom queries, especially if you've already made your own data tables, keep in mind SQL injection. At the heart of SQL injection is the problem that your database contains all your data. Um, it's basically holding absolutely everything and especially MySQL, but in general databases are generous by which I mean that if you submit one query or 20 queries, your database is gonna try to do its best to just answer all your queries, um, which is the heart of the problem with SQL injection. Um, your queries aren't gonna be perfect and probably what'll be the case is that someone will be able to put inside of a query, if you let them, a thing where you said age equals one, and then they can put a colon, and they can just write drop all the tables or something like that that's not perfect SQL um, into that thing. And if, assuming it's well-formed SQL that they've injected, uh, the database will happily run it. That's the heart of SQL injection. So you can basically be that you can 
an attacker can use the fact that a database is happy to run any arbitrary number of queries against you um, by doing a SQL injection attack. So to avoid it, the first thing to do is just don't write SQL. If you don't need to, if you can use update post meta, uh, WordPress is kind of in charge of keeping those sorts of things secure for you. So you don't need to be doing your own sanitization, et cetera, on SQL queries um, when you're just be, being able to uh, rely on update post meta or what have you. When you have to write SQL queries, uh, the, the heart of this solution to SQL injection is what we call parameterized queries in which, and what happens when you use something like WPDB prepare, or if you're outside of um, WordPress preparation in any database system, is that you've kind of identified holes in your query, and then you've said what you're filling the holes with. So you'll say that this age should be a numeral, and then when the database goes to fill that in with the, with the, um, the numeral that you've provided from the user, it says, hey, this doesn't look like a numeral. It looks like it's got a drop table uh, WP posts on it. Um, and so it doesn't actually execute it. So that's kind of how you protect yourself from SQL injection in general is that you create holes in your queries and then you let the database fill that in uh, knowing what to expect. Um, under the hood, WPDB is slightly different than actual database parameterization and uh, um, protection, but it works close enough to the same that we can say it's the same um, and this is the reason that WordPress doesn't do that is because of 5.2 compatibility, um, which is a long, complicated story I don't need to go into. Basically, always, always, always use WPDB prepare if you're going to write anything into the database so that then you, know, you provide the array of values to fill in rather than simply um, placing those values in yourself via something like string concatenation, which is very vulnerable to a basic SQL injection attack. Last thing before I wrap up are there are some security thoughts I just couldn't skip. The first one is update, update, update. Um, this is WordPress. Various plugins will have had some security vulnerability in the last week or month. And you just need to make sure that you're updating both WordPress core itself and all of that. People make mistakes. Software has issues that only later does a, some security researcher find. The easiest, easiest protection is to update everything all the time. Um, so, you know, that means your NPM dependencies, but it also means your WordPress site, it means your WordPress plugins, it means your themes, what have you. Um, the other thing I have to talk about is um, that strong passwords are an essential thing. Um, most WordPress sites are taken out by bad passwords. Um, or by not running updates when you should and leaving some vulnerable, known vulnerable uh, software out there. So use strong passwords on your WordPress sites. Better yet, use a password manager so you use strong passwords that are unique everywhere on the internet. And if you can, turning on two-factor auth, especially on your most important accounts, which may or may not be your WordPress site, I'm not gonna uh, fight you on that. If you feel like, oh, I don't need to turn two-factor auth on, on a WordPress site, I totally get it. Two-factor auth, for those who aren't familiar, is generally where you get a code on your phone. So it should rely on your phone. Google Authenticator, I use one called Authy. Um, even the SMS methods that banks will use by default, where they text you a code, is part of that second factor system. The idea is someone could steal your password, but someone probably can't steal your password and access to SMS on your phone or access to the app on your phone that stores your second password. And so that second password will typically be a four to six digit code that you can just put in. So definitely think about using two-factor auth on the accounts you like most. Um, whether or not those are WordPress sites, I'm not gonna be offended. Finally, like I said, uh, for more security advice, especially going over that all the stuff we skipped over here pretty quickly of like validation, validation, sanitization, escaping, uh, SQL injection, all of those like more classic WordPress security attacks. That is the heart of why I created WordPress security with confidence is that a lot of people know this stuff is important, but they don't have the time or the focus to actually go out and watch the 20 WordCamp talks it would take to understand it in the right depth. And so I've put together dozens of course, uh, dozens of videos on this course um, where it kind of just goes into plenty of detail. You can watch me attack sites with cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. Um, I did a password 
attack, um, many other things like that are in there. So if you're really hungry for even more security information, that's the place to go. And with that, thank you. Um, I do have a discount code. So if you are interested in WordPress security with confidence or anything else we sell at courses.wpshout.com, which is basically a different package called up and running for people who are new to WordPress, uh, you can get 20% off before November of 2018 with the code JS for WP. And that's all I've got. Thanks for watching this talk from the JavaScript for WordPress conference. If you're interested in more talks like this, head over to javascriptforwp.com conference to see an archive of all talks, as well as information about upcoming events.